Good morning, everyone. Today, our topic is sinusitis. Okay, so how this lecture will go? Simply, we are going to first discuss sinusitis, sorry, anatomy of sinuses. Um, and then of, uh, after discussing anatomy of sinuses, we are going to talk about uh, what is sinusitis. We will discuss acute sinusitis in detail, which is very common, and chronic sinusitis um, we will discuss but not in too much detail because like the important one is acute sinusitis and in the last one I'm, we are going to talk about the um, complications of that so uh, simply uh, like as you can see in this uh, figure you know they are, they, they are showing you the sinuses of course the frontal sinus the maxillary sinus which are the bigger one as well as the sphenoid and the thymoidal sinus so what are sinuses? They are uh, simply hollow air-filled cavities in the skull that are lined by a mucous membrane um, known as paranasal sinuses because of their formation from the nasal mucosa and their continued communication with nasal mucosa. So simply as the definition tells us that you know they are lined with the same mucosa as the nasal mucosa and they communicate or they simply open in the nasal sinus, nasal cavity. So um, <clears throat> Uh, this is like uh, uh, like uh, the purpose of sinuses is we had discussed already in the first lecture when we discussed the anatomy uh, simply you know uh, they humidify and they warm the inspired air they regulate the intranasal pressure they increase the surface area for olfaction and as they are hollow hollow, hollow so because of them that the skull is lighter in weight they give some resonance to the vo to our voice and they absorb shocks as well as contribute to the facial growth now the sinuses uh, no need to remember like all these details uh, the sinuses generally is divided into two main groups one is called as the anterior group and one is called as the posterior group the anterior one includes the maxillary this one the frontal and then the anterior ethmoidal um, this one okay um, now and all these anterior group basically uh, open in the middle meatus okay and uh, then there is a posterior group and the posterior group like is the posterior ethmoidal okay as well as the sphenoid sinus sphenoid sinus you know see they are quite back in location posterior that's why they are called as the posterior group okay um, now uh, this posterior sinuses um, uh, basically open in the superior meatus okay or sphenoethmoidal recess uh, so uh, like their opening is different you can say from the uh, anterior sinus um, you can see over here okay like I have explained the nasal cavity anatomy in in my first lecture and uh, see like uh, the opening of frontal as well as the uh, maxillary is in the middle meatus whereas like the posterior group which is the posterior thmoidal and the sphenoid their opening is there so uh, now guys like uh, I, I'm not going to go into detail anatomy that you know uh, it like which one like how the interior wall of the what you can say the maxillary sinus how the posterior wall how the medial wall how the floor all these things are made of course like there is no need to go in that detail so um, uh, like of course like the largest sinus is the maxillary sinus okay and of course like if you know where is the maxilla bone it is there and uh, the frontal sinus is the one which is located above your eyes and uh, uh, frontal sinus is the one um, simply uh, which uh, so like sometimes you know when we have sinusitis we have pain above the, our uh, orbital area uh, that is because you know the frontal sinus is full of secretions okay um, so that that's the reason of course like when we will discuss like sinusitis I'm going to talk about that um, so uh, <clears throat> like this is uh, simply uh, uh, frontal and maxillary are the bigger one ethmoidal and sphenoid are there but they are not too much big okay and ethmoidal are you know uh, very thin walled air cavities okay in the post uh, like of course in the ethmoid bone 
uh, whereas the sphenoid as you know it is in the sphenoid bone uh, the anatomy of the skull is very important in this regard okay uh, so now uh, as they are lined with the mu nasal mucosa so one thing to understand is simply um, like uh, they have the secret like they can secrete they can get infected and that's one of the reason guys like uh, uh, whenever like today our topic is sinusitis but you know um, like m sinusitis occurs um, in response to rhinitis and that's why um, you can also say this condition as uh, rhino sino uh, sinusitis okay uh, because like uh, <laughs> most of the time you know it is in combination with the rhinitis so that's that's the reason uh, so, uh, like, uh, uh, what is acute sinusitis? Simply, uh, it's the inflammation of the sinus mucosa. It is called as acute sinusitis. And uh, this the sinus, which is most commonly involved, is the maxillary, okay, followed uh, in turn by ethmoid and then the frontal and the sphenoid. Uh, and uh, simply, you know, uh, you can see over here, the sinusitis we can classify into um like multi sinusitis when more than one sinuses are inflamed or pan sinusitis when all the sinuses are inflamed um whereas like it can also be classified as open type or closed type uh, simply um when the secretions in, in that sinus uh, for example if there are secretions over here if they can drain into the nose it is called as open sinusitis but for example if this drainage is blocked from here so the secretions are going to collect like start will start collecting over here and if if this is the case so of course this will be called as closed sinusitis okay uh, now uh, uh, very important thing uh, in this one is uh, uh, what when we say like the sinus sinusitis is acute or chronic um, simply uh, when when the inflammation of the sinus is for less than four weeks we call it as acute sinusitis uh, when the inflammation is between four to eight weeks uh, we call it as subacute sinusitis but when the inflammation is more than eight weeks we call it as chronic sinusitis okay so less than four weeks is acute, four to eight weeks is subacute, and more than eight weeks is called as chronic sinusitis. Uh, this definition can vary from like uh, in different books, but uh, more or less it remains the same timing. Okay. Uh, so simply, uh, you can see classification by location and by duration. Uh, by location, see if it is maxillary, it is frontal, ethmoid, or sphenoid. If they are two or three. We call it as multi sinusitis, and if it is like four, we call it as pan sinusitis. Uh, though this thing is not so important clinically, because clinically, uh, most of the time uh, we treat sinusitis without doing much investigation. So, uh, whatever it is, like it's sinusitis, so we generally treat that. And of course, by duration, as I told you, acute bacterial, subacute bacterial, recurrent acute bacterial, chronic sinusitis or acute sinusitis superimposed to chronic sinusitis uh, by the way like if you want to make this thing easy you can simply remember add it as acute subacute and chronic okay <coughs> so <coughs> sorry um, like here you can see uh, here they're talking about days but as I told you better to remember it in weeks okay so um, less than four weeks is acute four to eight weeks is subacute whereas more than eight weeks is called as chronic one uh, now uh, okay like this one is like they are classifying uh, what you can say you can say acute and chronic over here etiologically acute and chronic and what are the common and uncommon causes uh, I am going to come on this thing in a in a while okay rather I want to talk about this thing first okay um, see um, many of the people uh, they have nasal infection okay and whenever someone have nasal infection 
of course like the nose is communicating with the sinus and the mucosa is there uh, so uh, this one is the most common cause of sinusitis so whenever we have rhinitis okay no matter like viral rhinitis or bacterial rhinitis of course uh, they can lead to sinusitis okay so uh, of course like uh, and now the issue is like many of the viral infections uh, which start which start as viral but later on uh, like uh, the bacteria they started invading the damaged mucosa so we call it a secondary bacterial infection right so uh, it, it will be like simply um, bacterial uh, infection superimposed on viral infection okay so what i'm saying uh, someone have viral rhinitis and of course that viral rhinitis will give sinusitis that collectively is called as viral rhinosinusitis and later on you know like bacteria and bacterial infection can occur over there so we call it as um, like bacterial uh, rhinosinusitis okay now many people you know who go for swimming or diving uh, and especially you know uh, like uh, sometimes the infected water can can enter into the sinus you know it can lead to sinusitis uh, one more thing you know the swimming pools are full of chlorine okay they, like if you know uh, when we swim like the water it touches our eyes and you know we, we have like some irritation in our eyes uh, basically that irritation is due to high chlorine content in the water and why they put high chlorine in the water just to uh, kill the microorganisms okay just to disinfect the water uh, <clears throat> so uh, because of this high chlorine content in the water um, it can cause some inflammation to the or irritation to the mucosa of the sinus which can lead to um, inflammation okay a uh, trauma is one of the cause but uh, uh, not so common cause okay uh, like fractures or penetrating injuries as well as dental infections uh, but uh, uh, remember this thing when it comes to the dental infections uh, you know it uh, only affect or it usually infect the maxillary sinus okay because the maxillary sinus is the one like our upper 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 teeth okay or the molars uh, or the premolar teeth you know uh, they are in connection with the maxillary sinus So other factors, you know, locally, uh, you can say there could be uh, uh, obstruction of the sinus ventilation, okay? So simply, uh, like all our mucosa keep on uh, secreting, uh, like there are secretions all the time and which are cleared by uh, what you can say, the movement of cilia. And that, that's the reason, you know, all the secretions are drained towards the nose. Uh, so any um, thing which, which uh, basically um, damages or destroy or uh, create problem with that cilia movement, you know, it can lead to sinusitis. Uh, for example, someone who had a nasal packing, uh, for example, someone who have a deviated septum or sorry, for example, someone who have um, any kind of allergies, okay. Uh, of course like uh, they can lead to uh, sinus problems uh, um, one more thing see status stasis of secretion in the nasal cavity like i talk about this one cystic fibrosis is a condition in which there is thick secretions okay uh, and uh, whenever there is thick secretions you know they are they are hard to clear or there is obstruction uh, like due to enlarged adenoids okay uh, you know the sinuses can get affected uh, simply and generally cold and wet environment okay uh, pollution smoke uh, as well as like anyone who have poor health poor health like you know diabetes is very important in this one anyone who have immune deficiencies or nutritional deficiencies of course like they can lead to uh, more infections generally not just sinusitis rather generally a lot of infections okay so um, uh, like uh, <clears throat> pathology of sinusitis like it's very easy uh, see there is swelling okay and due to the swelling see this ostia is uh, blocked and when this ostia will be blocked what will happen you know this area will be full of what you can say 
secretions okay if this blockage will be open of course all the secretions will go out okay uh, now guys uh, the important thing is to uh, so uh, like of course like the pathology is very easy to understand there is no rocket science in this one okay uh, like uh, the most common type of infections which we get anyways is upper, upper respiratory tract of infection which we call it as common cold okay so whenever you know there is inflammation there is hyperemia there is exudation of fluid there is uh, all the cells of inflammation are going to go to that mucosa and there is increased activity of the serous as well as the mucus producing glands okay and uh, what will happen that secretion will start collecting um, <clears throat> so um, what uh, to, uh, we should we can jump on is uh, uh, this one is like the same thing um, written in like a different type of classification okay and uh, of course like in, in immunosuppression Immunosuppressed patients, you know, there can be severe fungal infections, of course, or like someone who is having nasotracheal intubation or nasogastric tube, of course, they can have in the hospitals, they can have with multi drug resistant bugs. Okay, so um, the thing to remember over here is what um, the viral sinusitis or rhinitis are the most common cause, right? Uh, but like what we are discussing today is more like uh, bacterial sinusitis. Uh, now, uh, because why? Uh, because what we are going to study is uh, acute um, bacterial or acute separative um, sinusitis. Okay. So as you know, you know, the most common cause of pneumonia is streptococcus pneumonia. And it is the same organism, guys which is the most common cause of um, uh, sinusitis, okay? Streptococcus pneumonia will make the most common one. Haemophilus influenza, Morexella catharellis, Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus aureus, like they are there, Klebsia, Klebsiella, and there are many anaerobics, anaerobes as well. But of course, like they are the, uh, not the common one. So uh, remember, Never forget Streptococcus pneumonia, the common etiology. Okay, so now uh, uh, you know uh, in the books what you will found is uh, they have written acute maxillary sinusitis. You will found acute frontal sinusitis. You will found acute ethmoid sinusitis. You are going to found. Um, acute uh, sphenoid sinusitis okay uh, so um, now uh, the important thing I want to mention here is um, it's not important that you have to uh, remember it in this way uh, rather you can remember it together as sinusitis why uh, because uh, like it's it's the same condition just few of the sign and symptoms will be different okay so uh like i will go i will take it in this way uh, i will scroll through the slides okay i'm going to scroll through the slides but uh, um, uh, like I, I will talk about uh, what are the different, uh, what is the difference between being uh, someone having maxillary or frontal sinusitis? The etiology which we have already discussed remain more or less the same. Okay, uh, now, now uh, what happens is uh, anyone, you know, who have uh, sinusitis, okay, uh, what happens is uh, most, most commonly, as I told you, it is viral causes, okay followed by bacterial invasion. Um, now, uh, and and see the same things, you know, swimming and diving and all this stuff is written over here, which I've already explained. So, uh, remember guys, what happens when someone have infection? Uh, whenever some, anyone have infection, for example, if it's a viral infection. Uh, viral infections, no matter what kind of viral infection it is, uh, they give, uh, fever, 
uh, sometimes not very high grade, rather low grade. They give uh, uh, headaches, uh, sometimes myalgias, arthralgias, fatigue, okay, uh, runny eyes and runny nose. So what I'm talking about are, is the features of viral infection. Um, so of course, like the people who have sinusitis, uh, I'm, I'm talking as a whole sinusitis, not, I'm not discussing a maxillary right now, but all sinusitis. Uh, you can say frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoidal, whatever. Uh, so whatever is there, if someone have viral infection, which is the most common type, they will present with fever, general malaise, body aches, and all this stuff. But if someone have bacterial infection, okay, uh, maybe you will get some high-grade fever and you will get, the patient will get a toxic look plus a patient is going to produce secretions which are darker or green in color. So, all these patients, whenever there is sinusitis, whenever the sinuses are blocked, they present with fever and pain. And the pain, um, basically in the case of, for example, maxillary sinusitis, uh, if you can see over here, um, here, someone, this area is inflamed. So they will be having pain over here. Someone who have frontal sinusitis, they will be paining, pain, have, they will be having pain over here. Someone in which both of the frontal sinusitis are blocked, there will be pain above the eyes on both sides. Okay. So see, they may have pain. The pain can be here showing maxillary sinusitis, the pain can be here, showing frontal sinusitis. So headache, in case of frontal, more like a dental pain in case of maxillary, okay, or in the upper jaws, okay. So how we can check when we are going to examine the patient, you know, if you will tap over here or here or here or here, you will feel, the patient will feel some tenderness, okay? So there will be pain, there will be fever, there will be tenderness. Sometimes you can see redness over here or here. Depending on whatever <clears throat> sinus is involved, you are going to, the patient will be having tenderness. When you will tap this area, when you will put pressure, the patient will be having pain. That is called as tenderness. Okay, so fever, pain, of course, depending on the location, either a jaw pain, either a headache, redness, tenderness. Okay, now, whatever sinus is there, whatever sinus is there, it's maxillary, it's frontal, it's phenoid, it's ethmoid. Whenever they drain, they drain into the nose. So when you will examine the nose from here, anterior rhinoscopy, what you are going to found is nasal discharge. Okay. What you are going to found is a discharge. And of course, the color of the, that discharge can be clear or can be greenish in color. Okay. So... There is something called as postural test. For example, if we don't see any pus in the middle meatus, okay, and we still feel like that the uh, the patient have uh, sinusitis, uh, what they do is they take a cotton cotton swab and they give some sort of vasoconstrictor at the middle meatus. What that vasoconstrictor do? It decongests that area, or at least simply it opens that opening. And the fluid started draining out okay not so important and not so much clinically done yes it is done to relieve the symptoms because when the sinus is full of secretions and the patient is in pain so we can do this thing to to drain that sinus okay and it's not important that the drainage the drain or the pus is always coming from the nares it can go backwards and can cause post-nasal discharge, 
or post nasal dripping okay so again going on to the same thing we were discussing this thing so I, I believe I, I explained all the symptoms which are written over here okay uh, now see uh, what they are showing over here is uh, someone who had like they have created an opening over here to approach the sinus the maxillary sinus okay I will explain you why okay how we see so when the patients come we take history and in history points I already told you we do examination in examination you can feel the tenderness you can see the redness as well as you can do anterior rhinoscopy or posterior rhinoscopy uh, <clears throat> if needed we can do uh, something called as trans illumination test okay see uh, one way if the room is dark you know you, we can put the torch inside mouth which is like which which is a little awkward because you know the, the patient uh, may think or may have some concerns that the torch is not properly sterilized so see anyways in the in the mouth it's dark so see it's a torch or a lightning source which he's putting on the sinus and he will see inside how much light is coming if there is no sinusitis or the sinus have not secretions, no secretions inside, we can see more light here. But if the sinus have less uh, is full of secretions, of course, you will see less light. So this is called as trans elimination test, which you can do in the clinic. Otherwise, we can do X-ray. Okay. The x-ray, which is this one is taken, what we write as a water view. This is called as the water's view, okay? Uh, now, we can also do CT scan, okay? Which is a preferred thing, of course, because it is going to give more detail, view, more clear picture what's going on. But you can see in the x-ray, see the sinus is all clear. But if you can see over in this sinus, you can see a uh, air fluid level this is air and this is fluid you can see over here air fluid it means which sinus is this one maxillary right sided maxillary sinus is infected okay treatment okay this one is like the view of ct scan you can see over here the maxillary sinus is full of fluid showing you the ethmoid sinus as well as the frontal sinus. This is the orbits, right? So four CTs can give you a better view. How we treat it? Treatment is so simple, guys. If it is a documented bacterial infection, we give the patients antibiotics. Um, now, what is the most common organism? It is streptococcus pneumonia. So which antibiotic should be given? ampicillin or amoxicillin and they are very effective by the way if you think like there is some uh, atypical organism so you can use some macrolides like erythromycin clarithromycin or azithromycin okay of course like there is other options as well like doxycycline and many more okay uh, but for example, sometimes, you know, uh, if these uh, simple penicillins are not working like ampicillin or amoxicillin, then we go for a stronger one, uh, which is called as Augmentin, okay, or simply ampicillin with co-trimaxol, okay. Uh, we can also use third generation cephalosporins in that case, like uh, cefexim. Uh, but most of the time not needed like first generation phallosporins which is Velocef okay uh, also so Velocef is the company name by the way guys okay uh, so that one also works so of course antibiotics are given then there is nasal decongestant drops having oxymethazoline okay or simply methazylomethazoline and as you know they are 
call as the decongestant they are going to op open the pores and they will encourage the drainage you can ask the patient that, that they can take some steam inhalation uh, of course if they are in pain you can give them analgesics like paracetamol okay you can ask them to do hot compressors to soothe them to decrease the inflammation okay uh, if none of them is working then and if the if the sinus is full of uh, secretions then we go for surgic surgical drainage or enteral lavage uh, which is done in the case of maxillary sinus by this Carvel look approach see they make opening and they drain it from here okay so of course like in the cases when the, the patient is not getting relieved by this one uh, so guys like uh, this is like uh, the features for not just maxillary rather you can say for all the sinusitis okay so whatever it is maxillary or it is uh, frontal okay uh, the things will remain same, but just the, the site of the pain will be changed in frontal. For example, in maxillary, it will be above the jaws, but in frontal, it will be above the eyes. And tenderness you will find over there. Rest, there is no difference, guys. Okay. Uh, everything. So this one is like, see, the everything is rest. Everything is same. X-ray, water view. Here, the maxillary... Uh, I have some secretion but frontal I do have see this one okay and see the treatment also remains same the same thing what we do is antimicrobial nasal decongestants steam inhalation analgesics hot fermentation so everything will remain same the only thing which will be different in frontal sinusitis is again if you want to drain of course we cannot approach the frontal sinus as how we approach the maxillary sinus so basically what they do whenever they want to drain the frontal sinus uh, for example someone who have pain and fever and we know that you know there is abscess in frontal sinus or collection of pus in the frontal sinus okay they what they do like they can they can uh, make a cut over here basically within the this eyebrow or just below the eyebrow so that you know the scar mark is not will not be visible okay uh, <clears throat> uh, like uh, just to drain the frontal sinus okay so they make a small cut over here and from here you know they they, they make a hole inside the frontal sinus and see, they, they, they leave a catheter inside to drain it. Okay. So, this is like, this is the termination of frontal sinus. Okay. So, uh, complications of all this, you know, we are going to discuss in the end together. And the same thing with ethmoidal sinus. Nothing is different, guys. Just the pain location will be at the bridge of the nose. Because that's where the ethmoidal sinus so the pain will be here okay that's where the uh, ethmoidal sinuses are located so we can see edema of the lids you can see nasal discharge and all this one again uh, investigations will remain same uh, CT scan is the preferred one in this one x-rays cannot show so much clear um, and the last one which is acute sphenoid sinusitis again it remains the same same uh, what you can say investigations and same treatment uh, nothing nothing special so chronic sinusitis uh, is simply like when the infection is for more than eight weeks you know we, we label the patient as chronic sinusitis uh, so uh, you know <clears throat> someone who have acute infections is basically destroy the cilia or epithelium you can say so what happens like the secretions they get stagnant they cannot be drained as normally and uh, 
there is some mucosal changes there is loss of cilia someone who have allergies you know they have like continuous irritation to the mucosa so all this one you know simply it leads to impaired drainage and it leads to increased chance of infections so in chronic infections you know uh, the destruction basically is more than the healing process simply and the sinus in result of that can become hypertrophic called as hypertrophic sinusitis or can become atrophic called as atrophic sinusitis okay so just few of the things you we have to discuss in this one uh, <clears throat> now uh, the organisms are uh, which are both can be aerobic as well as anaerobic and the clinical features you know they are not so severe as uh, acute sinusitis like they are less in severity okay a nasal discharge, a continuous nasal discharge is the most common thing, you know, which the patients complain. Or a foul smelling discharge in case of anaerobic infections. And pain and tenderness are not so marked. And nasal stuff in azalgas, in osmia, in some of the patients. So guys, diagnosis is done in the same way. We take x-rays, we take CT scan, we, we can take the fluid, we can send it to the lab. Uh, just to confirm like what kind of organisms are there and treatment is basically uh, we, we found the etiological factor what is the thing which is causing this infection okay so we do work up we do culture of the secretions to know the exact organism to choose the antibiotic, the correct antibiotic. Okay, so we do culture and sensitivity for the selection of the exact antibiotic. And rest is same depending on the signs and symptoms. If the secretions are too much, if you believe that the patient have allergy, give them antihistamines. If you found the organism which is causing infection, give the patient antibiotics. <clears throat> okay. And... Uh, if the patient have too much stuffy nose, give them decongestants. Or simply what I'm talking about, the symptomatic treatment will be given. So now, uh, what you can say, uh, the important thing to mention over here is uh, uh, anyone who have chronic sinusitis um, or chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, it could be by the way, even fungal infections, of course, in immunocompromised people. Uh, it could be DNS, for example. Okay, deflected nasal septum. It could be allergies, I told you. It could be due to cystic fibrosis or ciliary disorders. Okay. Uh, so, there are many causes. Simply try to find the cause. Try to find the cause in chronic conditions. Simply, what is causing this thing? And treat the underlying cause. Okay and choose the proper antibiotic and all these things, okay? So we go in this way, in this one. Uh, now, um, anyone who have chronic uh, sinusitis, like you can see the enteral puncture is done. And this one is the Caldwell look approach, which I talk about like two or three times, okay? So depending on like either it's chronic maxillary sinusitis, Either it's chronic frontal sinusitis, okay, these are the name of the surgeries, you know, intranasal drainage operation, like of course, from the nose, you can drain the frontal sinus, or definition of the, of the frontal sinus, which I already showed you the photograph before, or external frontoethmoidectomy, this is the name of the procedure, lynch operation, so... Whatever sinus is involved, we can do ethymoidectomy or spinoidectomy. If it's a fungal infection, uh, of course, give antifungal medications. Okay. And nowadays, yes, this one, FES surgery, which is, you know, fundoscopic, uh, fundoscopic endoscope, you know, sinus surgeries are available in which, like, they use the fundoscope. This functional endoscopic sinus surgery, they can use this one. 
and they can reach the cells and they can drain it they can open it they can uh, drain them and clear them from the infection so um, this one is like uh, about uh, complete uh, what you can say treatment for chronic sinusitis the last topic which we are going to, to discuss will be um, okay well this one is like the explanation you know uh, which I already talk about okay 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 so um, complication of sinusitis now guys the important thing to understand here is um, sinusitis you know uh, all the structures which are close to brain they, we take we should take them quite serious because simply uh, what can happen is like the infection from these regions like sinuses like nose like eyes uh, can can spread to the brain or can spread inside the brain which is quite serious of course anything which is causing meningitis or encephalitis will make the condition of the patient quite pretty serious of course so we classify the complications uh, according to local complications orbital intracranial descending infections as well as focal infections so you can see in, the, in this one uh, in local infections you can see over here mucosal or mucomyloseal can form mucopioseal okay mucoseal or mucopioseal can form okay so <clears throat> of course like not so so common but you can see over see the the, the mucus uh, simply uh, frontal is the most common one which can be affected in this one in this one okay uh, what happens is due to chronic obstruction to the sinus there is accumulation of the secretion inside there, there and uh, they basically uh, destroy the bony wall okay and they can they can form this they can form this mucosal they can form in frontal they can form in ethmoid they can form in maxillary they can form but the most common unit is for, form in frontal of course okay and pyoseal is simply a ventus collection of pus we call it as pyoseal so uh, if you are interested of course you can go in details okay osteomyelitis is simply uh, inflammation of the bone okay so osteomyelitis when when the infection is affecting or causing osteitis or osteomyelitis for sure uh, it can be osteomyelitis of the maxilla it can be osteomyelitis of the uh, frontal bone okay um, and uh, you can see over here you know uh, osteomyelitis of the frontal bone results from acute infection of the frontal sinus of course okay uh, sometimes you know it can follow the trauma as well or surgery surgery for example so the pus may form externally under uh, the periosteum or uh, and it appears very what you can say uh, duffy or fluffy okay we call it as pot's puffy tumor uh, you can google the thing and you know you can found the picture on the google of how, how the pot's puffy tumor looks like so anyhow guys like whenever there is complication is there you know what what they have to do like of course they will do the surgery okay to remove that thing um, in orbital complications uh, the first very common complication can be what uh, it can cause edema of the eyelid okay it can cause lid like the upper eyelid especially you know it it will become thick inflamed or red okay so edema of the eyelid can occur 
uh, very common. So simply inflammation of dilate can occur, you can say. Inflammation of dilate can occur. Uh, now the important thing to hear here to mention is what like uh, uh, anyone uh, who have uh, the sinusitis, it can cause peri subperiosteal abscess, which is a collection mm -hmm. of the pus mm -hmm. in the periosteum. Okay. As well as it can, a very dangerous complication which it can cause is called as orbital cellulitis. Okay. See, like this is the eyeball that they, they are showing you in transection and see the edema, like the eyelid is inflamed. Uh, Subperiosteal abscess, like the abscess can be formed in the periosteum, under the periosteum. And uh, this is one of the very uh, like bad complications. Uh, simply when the pus break out from the periosteum and it reaches the orbit, we call this thing as orbital cellulitis. And see why it's important because see the eye is connected with, is moving by the help of extraocular muscles. So uh, this pus or this inflammation involves the muscles around the extraocular muscles, vessels, nerves, and the vision is affected. The person cannot move the eyeball simply. And the patient, you know, they are they present with high fever, and it is a very, quite a dangerous complication. Why? Because you know it is dangerous to the eye. It is dangerous to something called as cavernous sinus over here. Uh, I will tell you in a while uh, why cavernous sinus is important. Then there is, uh, of course, there can be abscess formation. Very important thing: is superior orbital fissure syndrome. If you if you have got an anatomy, uh, you must know. Uh, what is superior orbital fissure? It's a fissure behind the orbit. And uh, uh, simply, especially the infection from the sphenoid sinus, you know, it can it can uh, affect this area. And uh, the patient present with pain behind the eye, okay, with headache, and the nerves which are passing through this fissure, which is cranial nerve um, 6, 3, and four, okay, or you can say three, four, uh, three, four, and six. Uh, oculomotor, trochlear, as well as abducens, right? They are the one which can affect it. And orbital apex syndrome can also occur. Of course, like uh, uh, this uh, is superior to the orbital fissure, okay. And what happens, like there is the involvement of one more nerve, which is the trigeminal uh, V2 branch, guys, V2, okay, the maxillary one. The V1 is ophthalmic, V2 is maxillary, and V3 mm -hmm. is mandibular. So, this is orbital apex uh, complications uh, syndrome. Intracranial complications are very serious. See, when the frontal ethmoid and sphenoid why not maxillary? Because maxillary is not in direct contact with the brain. So guys, whenever um, <clears throat> the infection from these bones, you know, it can go inside the brain. It can cause meningitis. It can cause encephalitis. It can cause extradural abscess. It can cause subdural abscess. It can cause brain abscess. It can cause cavernous sinus thrombosis. Okay, so of course, like these are in surgery in medicine, you are going to study what 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 are these, you know, extradural, subdural. Like by the by the name, by the way, uh, it is quite easy. Now, one of the things which I want to talk about in the complication is called as cavernous sinus thrombosis. Cavernous sinus, if you are interested, you can see uh, it is located very close to the uh, eyeballs, okay, and sphenoid, frontal, as well as ethmoid sinuses. So, the infection can spread to the cavernous sinus and can thrombose that sinus, which we call it as cavernous sinus thrombosis, okay. For example, the infection from the nose, that's why nose and face is also called as dangerous area, okay. From the ethmoid sinus, from the sphenoid sinus, from the frontal sinus, from the orbit, from the upper lid, from the pharynx, from the ear, all these can spread to the cavernous sinus. And 
we call this thing as cavernous sinus thrombosis okay uh, there is uh, like sometimes it's very hard to differentiate either it's uh, orbital cellulitis cellulitis uh, or cellulitis or it is cavernous sinus thrombosis so uh, like orbital cellulitis is slow to start and it starts with edema of the eyelids with chemosis and proptosis like the eyeball is pushed forward uh, whereas cavernous sinus thrombosis start with high fever chills and there is edema to the eyelids chemosis and proptosis is there okay so orbital cellulitis is slow to start this one is high this one is abrupt quick quick thing see ophthalmo ophthalmoplegia is there uh, now uh, orbital cellulitis of course it involves most of the time one eye whereas cavernous sinus thrombosis it involves both of the eyes so simply whenever anyone has cavernous sinus thrombosis guys what happens is uh, the cavernous sinus is an area uh, which is surrounded by very important structures okay and the patients they become acutely ill their eyelids get swollen uh, reddish as well as protruded proptosis right and the cranial nerve 3, 4 and 6 which is again oculomotor, trochlear and abducens okay which are related to the sinus within close to them okay mm -hmm. so they all become plagic or ophthalmoplegia is there like simply the eyeball cannot move because mm -hmm. these are the nerves which control the eye so what happens is the pupils become dilated why because third nerve also carries the parasympathetic nerve fibers to the pupil so when they are gone the pupils become dilated the parasympathetic uh, effect is gone okay and uh, so there is problem with the vision and sensations in the trigeminal especially v1 branch the ophthalmic branch is also gone so the patients they cannot have sensations you can say on the forehead okay so we diagnose it by doing CT scan and uh, treatment is it is an emergency treatment is IV antibiotics uh, of course with attention to the focus of infection drainage of infection they do blood culture okay just to control this thing uh, this is the difference between orbital cellulitis as well as cavernous sinus thrombosis, which I was talking about. Okay, so see, this one is slow to start. This one is starts quickly, and uh, what is the other difference? Like most of the time, orbital cellulitis affect one of the eye, whereas cavernous sinus thrombosis it affect both of the eyes. Okay, involve both of the eyes, and this one involve. Uh, one of the eye. So, cavernous sinus thrombosis, if you will ask me, it is a very important complication, guys, to uh, what you can say to remember. And though, like, it's important to, uh, of course, like, uh, uh, remember, for example, intracranial complications are very important, right? All of them. But of course, I'm not discussing meningitis over here. Of course, someone whose meninges are inflamed. They present with you know nuchal rigidity or pain pain in neck as well as Brzezinski signs and Kernig signs and you know uh, the accentuation of headache by head jolt so of course like when you will study meningitis you would know what what I'm talking about or meningoencephalitis of course and extradural abscess as well as subdural abscess or brain abscess Whenever there is abscess in the brain, you know, they, 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 they act like space occupying lesion. They, they cause pressure on the brain and they give a lot of neurological manifestations in the patients. Okay. Uh, and of course, like whatever the complications are there, of course, some like surgery will be done to remove this or to remove this. Antibiotics will be given as well as surgical uh, drainage of that uh, abscess or pus. So of course, like all these things, you know, can be treated by antibiotic surgeries or XYZ. 
Um, of course, the, like the last one is like descending infections. Okay, uh, of course, like when the infection from the sinuses they descend down. They can they can involve the ears because ears is connected with the nose by or the pharynx by the help of eustachian tube. So it can lead to otitis media. It can lead to pharyngitis or tonsillitis. Come below, it can cause laryngitis or tracheobronchitis. So, simply these are the descending infections which can be caused, okay, uh, as well as the focal infections. So, uh, of course, like, not so important, the focal infection, but the important ones I already told you, criminal sinus thrombosis as well as the intracranial complications remains the most important complications of sinusitis. Nowadays, the sinusitis complications are not so common, guys, but because of the advent of good antibiotics. Okay. So, simply anyone who have complications, uh, consider hospitalization in them, hospitalize them. And there is something called as, you know, when we talk about the orbital uh, uh, complications, especially, there is something called as Chandler's classification. Chandler's classification. Chandler's classification. So, classification. So, what is a Chandler classification for orbital cellulitis or orbital complications? Is preseptal cellulitis, post septal cellulitis, subperiosteal abscess, orbital abscess, or cavernous sinus thrombosis? Okay, I, I, I told you whenever there is uh, abscess in the subperiosteal region of frontal bone, it is also called as parts puffy tumor. And uh, very important cavernous sinus thrombosis, very important superior orbital fissure syndrome, what is orbital act, apex syndrome. So, superior orbital facial syndrome is when the cranial nerve third, fourth, and sixth are gone. The eyeball is fixed, it's immobile. The pupils will be dilated. There will be ptosis. Okay. And V1, the V1 uh, <clears throat> division of trigeminal will be gone. So, hypoesthesia. Decreased sensations in the forehead. So whenever, so this is like, these features are the features of what? Superior orbital fissure syndrome. I, I, would, I would like to write over here, you know. So, superior orbital fissure syndrome. What I'm talking about is third, fourth, sixth palsy, which will lead to what? Immobile orbit or eyeball. Okay. What will be there? Dilated pupils. Why? Because the parasympathetic nerve fibers, which are around the third cranial nerve, are also affected, as well as ptosis drooped eyelids and v1 is gone trigeminal so hypoesthesia <clears throat> uh, in the forehead so this is orbital superior orbital fissure syndrome what is orbital apex syndrome it is all of the above which we which i already write Plus, uh, neuritis, <clears throat> papillo, papilledema. See, the optic nerve is also involved now. And when the optic nerve is involved, what is the function of optic nerve? Vision. So, decreased visual equity. Okay. See, the story is very clear. So everything, 
all these two are almost same guys the only difference is what in orbital apex syndrome optic nerve is also involved hope you understand hope you enjoy okay so we had done sinusitis chronic and severe uh, acute and chronic we had done anatomy we had done clinical features as well as complications thank you so much